In this video, we are going to continue our discussion of the nucleus to incorporate radioactive decay. To do that, we need to look at, uh, first of all, what in terms of particles is the nucleus made of, what particles might be being ejected from the nucleus during a radioactive decay event, and why this uh, event occurs in the first place. So to do that, let's look at the standard model of particles, which although technically not in, um, typically not presented in a general chemistry textbook, it really is indirectly, so I don't know why we don't just acknowledge that that's what we need. Okay, so for now let's ignore Let's ignore, so ignore this for now. Uh, this is going to be the Higgs boson, which we'll come back to later. But let's look at the symmetry of the 16 boxes below it. Um, now, we won't, we'll mention what all of these are, but we definitely won't need all of these. But let's try and, um, let's try and identify what they are. First of all, you'll see if I can box them in. Oh, I guess that wasn't a great attempt. So I can see if I can do it a little bit better. We have, nope, not doing a very good job here either. Let's see. We've got these guys. I'm looking at the screen and I'm writing off on the side. So easier said than done. Okay. So these guys are the quarks. We have the up down, the charm strange, and the top and bottom quark, uh, which I've given here below in this uh, legend here. So the up, down, the charm, strange, the top and bottom. Uh, I'll change the pen color. We have leptons down here. So let's see if I can get this done. These guys are the leptons. So we've got leptons, we've got our quarks, okay. Uh, so going back to the leptons, we've got the electron, the E minus, that's the one we know and love. Then below that we have the electron neutrino. Next we have the muon, and below that the muon neutrino. So muon here, the neutrino nu of the muon here, tau particle, and then the tau neutrino. So the electron, electron neutrino, muon, muon neutrino, um, and again, I have these words spelled out further down here in this legend. Okay. And then finally, let's use, um, I guess, a different color, green. We've got the force carriers. So these guys over here. Oh no, now I've done something I didn't. Oh, it's because I'm pressing a button. Okay, I guess if you press that button, I didn't know I had you erase stuff. It's good to know. So now we have the force carriers.
Okay, so we have the photon at the top here. This is a gamma symbol to represent any photon, an electromagnetic wave. We have the W plus and minus and the Z bosons. And we have the gluon. So essentially the quarks and the leptons are the stuff. And the force carriers are the glue that connects the stuff to other stuff. So this is the standard particle, um, the standard model of particles. And for the most part, what we're going to be interested in uh, are the stuff that make atoms, the atoms that uh, we can get chemistry out of at least. So for the most part, we are going to be interested in the following. Um, essentially, let's see, we're going to be interested in this slice. And let's see, yeah, for the most part, these guys, that's what we're going to spend most of our time with. Okay. So moving on to the next page. In my little list here. All right, so that, that was just an introduction to um, to the players on the field. So I'm going to scroll over to the next page over here. All right, we've already discussed this, so let's just keep going down. Okay, let's go to the quarks. Okay, so again, the ones that we're really interested in are the up and down. Let's just comment on a couple of things about the up and down quark and we'll ignore the rest. So the up and the down quark, let's go to red. So I'm only looking at these guys. The table's there for completion, but we can only worry about these ones. Notice the spin a half particles. The spin a half, that means they obey Pauli exclusion principle because they are fermions. So that's one thing I want you to notice. They are fermions because they have in, uh, half integer spins. And that means they obey Pauli exclusion. Principle. Okay. So they have to have different quantum numbers, what have you. They can't coalesce the same state, quantum mechanical state. Um, okay. Notice that they don't have an integer charge. So this is unusual. This seems to violate quantum mechanics, but it also tips you off that maybe they don't, they can't be isolated. They come in clusters of quarks. Okay. So be on the lookout for that. That's very unusual. Uh, and they have a baryon number of a third. Here's another clue as well. Um, we haven't commented what a baryon is yet, but you can see that um, the clue is here, these have a baryon number of a third. Um, a baryon is a collection of three quarks. So a baryon here just means a collection of three quarks. Uh, where would I put that? Let's put that over here. 
it's a three quark collection so baryon is a three quark collection um, in general these quarks are hadrons but hadrons just means something that obeys the strong force uh, I don't think we've really commented on the strong force yet but if you obey the strong force you're a hadron if you're a collection of three quarks you're specifically a baryon um, and eventually we might see that if you're a collection of only two quarks you are a uh, meson but for now just be aware of this term baryon okay and we're not too much interested in the energy value um, but these masses are measured in terms of their energy we'll see how this mass to energy conversion is done momentarily uh, so don't pay much attention to the energy again this is just completion and the unit here is mega electron volts okay so i think we've commented on the important stuff uh, fermions obey power exclusion okay scrolling on to our next page the benefit of knowing this up and down quark configuration is now we can look at the structure of the nucleus so the proton the fundamental particle of the atomic nucleus is a um, could be thought of as a well is thought of as a baryon this is a slightly oversimplistic viewpoint um, but it'll do uh, for our general chemistry audience the proton we can say is made up of three quarks therefore it's a baryon importantly it's a composite structure so it's not a point structure it's got internal dimensions to it um, so the proton although it's a fundamental particle uh, it's made of other stuff that's important to acknowledge and we can see that it's a collection of three quarks it's actually two up quarks and a down quark just recapping from the previous slide we saw that the charge remember the charge we had an issue with the charges they weren't they were non-integer charges but we can see here that if a proton is a mixture of uh, a down quark and two up quarks and if we remind each other of the charge we've got a negative third charge for a down quark and positive two-thirds charge for up quarks then if we look at the total charge of the proton we've got two thirds for the up quark plus another two thirds for an up quark and then minus a third for the down quark we add those together we get three thirds or one so this is where the this is where the plus one charge of the proton comes from so it's a composition of its quark structure or the charge structure of the composite quarks leads to the overall positive charge of the proton we can look at the neutron which is the other member of the nucleus of an atom again it's a baryon it's a collection of three quarks but now it's an up and two down quarks again if we inspect the charge composition of these things we've got the up quark with a positive two-thirds charge we've got the down quarks so we've got two of them here each with their negative a third charge we add them together we've got a positive two-thirds and then two single negative a thirds well they just sum to should be an equal sign there they sum to zero charge and we know that the neutron has no charge okay so we can account for the charge of the nucleus by looking 
sequentially at the individual baryons that can constitute the nucleus. Let's move on. So we're getting through this pretty quick, but quick is not always bad. Let's move on to look at, and again, these are just some notes I would give to my students and I'm just annotating them as a read through. Um, it's always odd without any feedback from the class and questions that might otherwise have been asked. It's hard to know what the class might have asked, so therefore it's hard to a priori know what to answer. But um, okay, well, let's move on to look at the strong force or the color force. Well, actually, the color force is not exactly the strong force, but there's definitely a relationship there. Um, and I'm thinking, do I want to look at this one there? Yeah, let's look at this. This might not be the easiest slide to look at. And it might be one we, we might want to come back to as well. But let's look at the quarks. Um, this diagram is a pretty classical diagram, although it's quantum mechanics, that's an oxymoron. It's a classical way to show um, the strong force in action. So let's have a look. Let's make that a bit smaller so we can see everything. Okay. Um, so we have a problem. The nucleus is very small and it's full of positive charge. And we know from electrostatics that like charge repels. So why on earth does the nucleus not just annihilate itself 100% of the time instantaneously? And that's because at short distances, there's a, a force called the strong force that can overpower the electrostatic repulsion of the positive charges. So let's see how that might play out in the real world. So if we look at this diagram here, we've got time flowing in the, in the up direction. So make a note of time here. So if we read it from bottom to top, We've got, let's see, we've got a neutron, which we said is a collection, it's a baryon, it's a collection of three quarks, an up quark and two down quarks, and a proton, two basic members of the nucleus. So over time, we can see that a proton is actually capable of becoming a neutron. So all it has to do is flip one of its up quarks for a down quark. So if we ignore this messy middle bit here, we just look at the projection of these three quarks here. We can see that this up quark stays as an up quark. This down quark stays as a down quark. But then this up quark eventually becomes a gluon and then the gluon comes back as a down quark. And now we've got a neutron. And the opposite is happening over here in this diagram. We've got an up quark through time is staying as an up quark. We have a down quark remaining a down quark. We have this down quark. Uh, at this event is becoming a gluon. And then at this event, the gluon is becoming an up quark. <clears throat> so we've flipped a down quark for an up quark, and we've therefore converted that neutron to a proton. So we began with a neutron and a proton, and then over time we had a proton plus a neutron. So on average, we haven't done anything, but it's a dynamic process. So the nucleus is not to be thought of as just a lump of mass that doesn't do anything. It's a turbulent environment where stuff is happening. It's the place to be. Okay, so let's look at some of the detail. Let's look at how we might do this quark uh, flipping. 
Okay, so let's look at the bit that's actually changing. So if we have this down quark here, then at this event, at this time, <clears throat> this down quark spontaneously splits up into a gluon, which is the strong force carrier, and a down quark goes this way. Um, <clears throat> another way we can think of it is um, at this event here we have a gluon so let's say the gluon is coming this way from bottom to top the gluon, the strong force carrier is spontaneously becoming an up quark and an anti-up quark. So this bar on top of the up quark means anti. Um, notice that this is now an antiparticle, and by convention, antiparticles are thought to, at least diagrammatically, in these diagrams, are thought to move back in time. So notice the arrow is moving against the time arrow. So the antiparticle now diagrammatically is moving backwards in the time direction of the diagram. Okay, so we've produced a particle and an antiparticle from this gluon. Um, let's see, let's follow this antiparticle here. So this antiparticle is now on a collision course with its particle. So here at this event, we have the union of an antiparticle moving backwards in this time axis with a regular up quark moving forwards in this, and there's an annihilation event here. So mass, matter and antimatter annihilate, and they spontaneously produce a gluon which is the symmetry of this previous event here. So gluon produces a particle and its antiparticle. The particle and the antiparticle can reversibly produce the gluon or a gluon again. Um, <clears throat> the damn quark can spontaneously produce a gluon here. So let's look at this, essentially this connection between these two events, this anti-up quark and this down quark. So we've got a D and a U with a little bar in it. So this is a, this is a meson. A meson just means it's a collection of two quarks. In this case, it's an up quark and a down quark. There are many types of meson. Um, there is no reason to doubt this is the only meson. It's a chemistry joke. Uh, okay, so there's many types of meson. Um, meson is just a collection of two quarks. This particular meson um, is uh, a peon. So this particular meson is a peon. Um, it's a peon because it's known as a pi meson. So pi meson just becomes known as a Peon. And specifically, we call this a pi meson. It actually has uh, a negative charge to it uh, that we'll worry about later in this video, but later in this video. So essentially, we can think that the neutron, again, going back up in time here, we can think that the neutron 
and the proton as they move forwards in their time projection they exchange a pi meson with each other um, now where is the strong force in all of this well the strong force without without going into too much detail the quarks are held together by something called the color force and i i don't want to get into too much detail about that because that would take us a little bit um for my students i've given them supplemental reading that mentions the color force uh that's more than enough at this stage um more than some people would dare at this stage but um it really does help the conversation if you dare to do something Anything, I think, always helps the conversation. Some people don't dare, uh, but that's never been my problem. Um, the strong force is the resid is essentially an overflow of the color force. So the color force is the is a it's a property that quarks have similar to charge, but not really charge. Um, the word colors are relevant it's just a label so it's got nothing to do with color and that's why i don't want to get too into it um, there's a lot of physics humor in some of these labels and therein lies the the funny part because statistically physicists don't have any sense of humor but anyway um which i would vehemently disagree with but essentially the there's a a, a force that holds the quarks together and it's very strong and essentially when the quarks are sloshing back and forth there is a residual force that keeps the, all the baryons together and that's called a strong force so the strong force is not the same as the color force the strong force is the excess net excess of the color force that tries to cancel itself out um, and it's strong enough to keep the to overwhelm at short distances it's strong enough to overwhelm the electrostatic repulsion and as we know most nuclei are stable okay so let's move on now I do expect my students can draw these type of diagrams but there's a simpler version of this which we'll come to in the next slide but this has a lot of this has the the, the glory of the detail uh, that sometimes can be forgotten when you look at these more simple diagrams. So here's a the same diagram, and I've alerted my students to go back to page ten. This would be um, a Feynman diagram to look at the strong force. So we've just seen on that previous slide that we had the way I drew it. We had time going this way. we had the neutron on its merry way at this event spontaneously ejecting the pi meson or the peon and the proton and then at this event here the pi meson connected with the proton to give the neutron um, let's have a look at so we know where, it, where the pi came from that was a peon right p for pi pi for p um, let's look at the negative charge now so when we look at Feynman diagrams it's very good to look just at the charge conservation of charge so we start off with no charge a neutral a neutral neutron uh, here and then the neutral neutron terminates at this event here so if no charge goes into this event no charge can come out of this event so we have the sum of a positive charge and therefore that has to be negative because a positive and a negative equals a zero so we have conservation of charge likewise a net negative charge this pi meson goes into this event here so that means Oh, sorry, a, a negative charge comes into this event, but it's joined by a positive charge. So a positive charge and a negative charge terminate at this event here. 
Well, a plus and a minus is zero, so therefore don't be surprised when zero charge comes out. So we have conservation of charge, and if you look carefully and remind yourself, this is just the most simplified way. Again here we've represented the pi meson, or the peon, as the down and anti-up quark from page 10. It just becomes a much more simple way to draw this diagram. So look at those together and you will see that the one on the right, although it has less detail, it assumes that you know, it's, it's basically a shorthand way, but you can quickly have a conversation about it in less time. Okay. So I do expect that my students can draw several key Feynman diagrams. This is one of them. So this strong force, again, is a residual of the color force. So it's a residual. I'm getting the hang of this pad now. We haven't said too much about, we haven't said anything really about the color force, and that's because it gets into a, something that we really shouldn't be poking our toe in at this stage. Um, but it's essentially to link it back with the nucleus. Um, the strong force, which is a residual of the color force, This is what binds the nucleus together. And we saw that that binding energy came from Einstein's equation. And we've seen this in a previous video. This is the energy that binds the nucleus together and the strong force is the force carrier that's responsible for the binding energy. Okay, so that's the connection back to our merry little video on time dilation and equals mc squared. So hopefully now my students can see that there is some kind of link going on. Okay, let's start to look at the weak forces now. So we've seen the strong force with the gluons. Um, let's have a look at the weak force. Um, so the weak force comes from things like radioactive decay. So we're not we're not you know annihilating the nucleus now. We're just allowing the nucleus to spill slowly, like a faucet slowly spilling. Um, its nuclear material. Um, we're going to come back to baryons, a word we mentioned earlier, and leptons. So let's look here at beta decay. There are two flavors of beta decay I want you to be aware of, um, and you can see two Feynman diagrams here on the left. Um, one, <clears throat> so let's look at, actually, let's look at the Feynman diagram first, I guess. Um, so this is the Feynman diagram here. Again, I'm going to assume that time is going this way. So we have a neutron coming up here with no charge, and it enters this event, and then it annihilates at this event and produces a proton with a positive charge, and it has to have a force carrier now it's a weak force, so there's three options. We've got the W plus or minus, or the Z0 gauge boson. This has to be W minus, just because of charge conservation. Zero charge goes in. Zero charge comes in. The sum of a positive and a minus charge, therefore, comes out, which sums to zero, and annihilates at this event. Well, if a negative charge went into this event, a negative charge must come out, and therefore 
this particle, which is an anti because of the bar, an anti electron neutrino, this anti electron neutrino has no charge. So negative charge goes into this event, negative charge comes out, and this is an electron or a beta particle. So um, beta decay, a negatron, a negatively charged beta particle is essentially just an electron. Um, we can write this as E minus, we can write it as beta. Uh, some people write beta minus because they there's a positive beta as well. Um, but this is what we mean by a negatron, a negatively charged particle from beta decay. So this thing here. Okay, so that's the Feynman diagram, and I expect my students can draw that moving forward. Let's look at the tabular version of this, which you'll notice is not as good because it doesn't have the force carrier. So Feynman allows us to talk about the force carrier. Um, this diagram doesn't, this table here won't contain the force carrier. So it has less information, but let's look at it anyway, because we can talk about conservation of um, baryon number and lepton number. Remember a baryon is a collection of three quarks. And by definition, all baryons have a baryon number of one, and anything that's not a baryon has a baryon number of zero. So we have to preserve baryon number. So overall, we have a neutron became a proton. So we have a neutron became a proton. So therefore, a neutron is a baryon. It's a collection of three quarks. And a proton became a uh, proton, sorry, is a baryon. It's a collection of three quarks. Um, so we have a baryon went in, a baryon came out. The other stuff that we made, the beta particle, the negatron, and the anti-electron neutrino, they are not baryons. They're leptons, so they have a baryon number of zero. So I have conservation of baryon number one became one. Leptons are not baryons. By definition, the negatron or the electron has a, an, a lepton number of one. The electron neutrino has a lepton number of one, but that's not what we have here. We have the anti-electron neutrino, which therefore is opposite of one and is therefore negative one. So I have one plus negative one, which is zero. So conservation of lepton number, the zero leptons on the left of the arrow, one plus negative one sums to zero lepton number change on the right of the arrow. So we have conservation of baryon number and lepton number. And this conservation of baryon and lepton number is something I want my students to be able to do on an assessment. Okay. Scrolling down, that's one type of beta decay. Another type of beta decay is positron emission. A positron is an anti-electron. So if you compare the two Feynman diagrams, well, let's look at the second Feynman diagram, then we'll compare the two, I guess. Again, we have time here. <clears throat> here we have a proton comes in. At this event, positive charge on the proton becomes a neutron with no charge. Therefore, we need to preserve that positive charge. <coughs> Excuse me. In the form of a, a W plus. I totally obscured the thing now. Uh, the, the positive charge on the gauge boson here. So we have a plus goes in plus comes out, annihilates at this event here, plus goes into this event, so a plus comes out, 
that's our positron, which is our electron, but with a positive charge. And here we have zero charge on our regular uh, electron neutrino. We can tabulate this over here. We don't have the force carrier now. That's the beauty of the Feynman diagram. But we can look at conservation of baryon and lepton number. So over time, we had a proton became a neutron and a positron and an electron neutrino. One baryon was exchanged for another baryon. So we have conservation of baryon number. Recall that the electron or the negatron has a, a lepton number of plus one. So therefore the opposite, the antiparticle has the positron has a lepton number of negative one. Recall the anti-electron neutrino had a lepton number of negative one. So its antiparticle is the regular electron neutrino which has a lepton number of plus one. So we sum the lepton numbers, they sum to zero, which matches the left side. So conservation of these two important numbers um, is something that I would expect you can do and are aware of. Okay, so we have uh, beta, two forms of beta here, negatron and positron. Um, I think I have yeah, the third form of beta on the next slide is electron capture. So let's have a look at electron capture, which is essentially a cross multiplied form of positron. But let's have a look at that. So electron capture is the third type of beta I want us to worry about. Here's the Feynman diagram again. So we've got time going this way. So essentially take positron. So just before we look at this, go back to the previous slide and look at positron again, which you'll recall was just a proton gives a neutron plus a positron and an electron neutrino and all you do is you take the positron and you bring it over here now like in math if you take something the other side of the equal sign you change the argument so when this positron comes over here it becomes a regular electron and then we have electron capture so that's the way i would encourage you i'm sure you'd spot that anyway mm -hmm. I don't know that one. but that's the way that was my alexa in the background that's the way i would uh, encourage you to think of it Okay, so we have an electron and a proton, or a, a negatron and a proton annihilating at this event here. We've got a negative charge and a positive charge. They come together here, the charge is sum to zero. So we have a zero charge force carrier, which is the Z0 gauge boson. So we've seen all three types of bosons used now. Bosons, by the way, you'll recall from quantum mechanics, don't obey Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, only fermions do with their half integer uh, spin. So <coughs> gauge bo uh, these bosons have uh, integer spin. At this event here, no charge comes in because it's only in the form of a Z0 gauge boson. So therefore, no charge would come out. We've got a neutral neutron. And remember, neutrinos have zero charge as well. Okay. Let 
Let's look at the conservation of lepton and baryon number again. So we have uh, a baryon, a proton goes in, a neutron comes out, conservation of baryon number. Uh, a, uh, a negatron goes in, an electron neutrino comes out, conservation of lepton number. Okay, so that's the third and final type of beta decay for us. Uh, we don't have much more, just a couple more pages to conclude this video, so let's let's go on and try and keep it within the hour. <clears throat> okay. So I think definitely, you know, if you're looking at this material for the first time, it's not hard. There's just a lot of unfamiliar ideas that will be unfamiliar to most people on first inspection. But as I always remind my students, don't confuse hard with unfamiliar. Uh, there's nothing really hard that we've shown here. There's not a lot. Of, there's no mathematics that we've shown. Um, there's just some diagrams with adding up pluses and minuses. So if you claim something, if you label something as hard, be really sure it's hard and not just unfamiliar. Okay, and I would argue this is the latter. Okay, let's look at the weak force carriers. Um, actually, I don't really want to... I think this is anecdotal. I've put this in for my students. Um, we can comment on it. If I was in a class full of people, they might ask about this and this would just be, um, I think I'm actually going to ignore this, this, uh, this early topic of conversation here because there's nobody here and nobody has commented on it. Um, the, the, the original reason for adding this was to look at violation of conservation of energy um, and if there's a Heisenberg way to get out of it that we'll mention in a second anyway. So uh, moving on for the good of the cause. Um, let's just look at these Feynman diagrams. So we've seen a, a four Feynman diagrams so far. Um, there's definitely some, you know, more fully formed ways you can do these Feynman diagrams <clears throat> and less fully formed ways you can do them. So let's have a look. Um, we can strip this thing down and look just at the quarks. So again, in these diagrams, I'm always going to have time going this way. And not everybody does, but I think so long as you know where your time axis is, um, then you can kind of know which way you're meant to be looking at these. So you're going to look at my Feynman diagrams from bottom to top. Some people go top to bottom, some people go left to right. Um, I just have a habit of doing bottom to top. Um, so we can look at, for example, over here, a down quark becoming an up quark um, and a W minus gauge boson. So this is negatron. So remember we had the remember we had the neutron became the proton and that's because a down quark was becoming an up quark. Um, and we had the conservation of energy, um, a negative gauge boson went in here because of the charge conservation of the proton becoming the neutron. The negative gauge boson uh, met with the neutrino to give an electron. Another way you could draw this in a bit more detail is to flesh out exactly what's happening here. Um, so instead of just having the down quark, you can add the other two quarks in to really flesh out the fact that it's a neutron becoming a proton. 
Okay. So essentially, this Feynman diagram here is stripped bare. Here we've got a bit more detail. Notice something interesting I've done here as well. So this is the way we presented it last time with the production at this event here, the production of an anti-electron neutrino. Well, an anti-electron neutrino, an anti-particle and a particle have a different orientation in time. So I've just replaced this anti-particle going that way with um, a regular electron neutrino uh, earlier. So have a look at that. Rather than production of an antiparticle, I've got the annihilation of a regular particle, which would uh, be the same thing. And then the way I actually did present it, so arguably the top left, not enough detail, the middle one may be more than we need. And then the one on the right, the Goldilocks representation may be just right. We've just got the neutron annihilates at this event here to give a plus charge and a minus charge, the proton and the W minus gauge boson annihilates at this event to preserve its charge in the negatron particle and the anti-electron neutrino, which is neutral. Okay, so just different ways of representing these Feynman diagrams. Um, okay, the next slide is actually the last slide in this video. <clears throat> and it, it's a preface to the next video in which we look at the Higgs boson. But I wanted to just comment on particle mass because you don't always need the Higgs boson to explain mass. Um, so I want to just comment where the mass of these particles can come from. <clears throat> and we can comment on why the proton and the neutron are so much more massive than the electron, or why leptons, which are essentially point particles like the electron, why they're so puny and massless, respectively, uh, comparatively massless, not exactly massless, but relatively massless compared with baryons, which remember are composite particles. <clears throat> so again, this is the last slide of this video. So let's look at particle mass. This, <clears throat> this is an example of, um, so this is not the same diagram I had earlier to represent the strong force. If you recall the original diagram I had, um, and I actually have it here, so rather than the guess which one I gave you, I'll look at the exact one I gave you. Yeah, I had this one up before. I have the neutron. the proton <clears throat> and we have the pi minus or the pion. <clears throat> so here I have another type of pion but now this pion has no charge and that's because I'm not really doing anything here I've just got a proton not changing the proton is becoming a proton, the neutron is becoming a neutron. So I don't want an exchange of any, you know, if we look at this event here, no charge came in, no charge came in, no charge comes out. Or if we look at this event here, plus charge went in, no charge came out, so the plus charge remains. So again, you can kind of just look in these Feynman type diagrams, look at conservation of charge. Anyway, um, so let's have a look at what we have to say um, 
five men left. Okay. <clears throat> so let's have a look at what we have to say about, about this. So recall from Einstein's equation e equals mc squared. So therefore, a change in energy is a change in mass. C squared is C squared, but now our change in mass is the mass of the pion. If it were this diagram, it would be the pi minus but in this diagram, it's the pi zero. Now we're going to use Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So this diagram over here, this equation here, this is just Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Which essentially says that for a small amount of time, if delta t tends to zero, delta E tends to infinity. So for a small amount of time, your uncertainty in energy is essentially infinite and therefore meaningless. So energy barriers lose all meaning at certain time intervals. Or for short amounts of time, you can violate, violate energy conservation. So essentially, energy conservation can be violated temporarily according to this. It's a measurement issue, so we don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> But it can't be less than h bar over 2, where h bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi. Okay, so if we were to solve for delta t, take the equal sign of here. So assume that this is now equal, because that's as small as it can be. And solve for delta t, then we bring the delta e down stirs here. So we get delta t is h bar over 2 delta e. We know that delta e is m pi naught c squared, so we can write m pi naught c squared here. And we know, let's see, We know, let's see, where do we know this from? We know this from a previous video, actually. We know from a previous video that um, the distance over which the strong force operates, so here D is distance, the distance over which the strong force operates is approximately the dimensions of the nucleus itself, which is about 10 to the negative 15 meter. So this is the dimensions of the nucleus itself. So whether you consider that to be the radius or the diameter, it doesn't really matter. You just have a factor of two there, but it's still about 10 to the 15, 10 to the minus 15 meter as an order of magnitude. And we know that that distance is a speed times a time. So we can now solve this distance um, essentially in terms of time. So if distance is speed times time, then delta t is distance over speed. So instead of time, we've replaced time with distance and we've just added this factor uh, we've just added the factor of c to it, 
uh, or rather we can say that if I get my original one back if I actually want it in terms of distance then I've got to multiply delta t by c so I put a c here and this cancelled one of the c's here and I got this value here okay so hopefully you can see through my scribbles there a bit point of the scribbles is to make it easier not harder <laughs> okay so finally we can get around to calculating equals mc squared so again we've got equals mc squared which we know is equal to um, h bar c over 2d we can plug some numbers in so h bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi so we can do that in a calculator we get this value here very small number speed of light which is this value here the number 2 and then d is the approximate size of the nucleus we can plug the numbers in and we get an order of magnitude around 100 mega electron volts so if you recall earlier on in our slide on the standard model we said that not to worry about the energy of these particles but remember the unit mega electron volts well this would be one way that you could determine those numbers so because the mass and energy equivalency of units rather than measure the mass of subatomic particles which you couldn't measure practically, we just measure the energy or calculate the energy. But as you can see here, there's no mention of the Higgs boson anywhere. There's no mention of the Higgs field. So we don't need the Higgs field to give mass. We don't need the Higgs field to generate mass in general. We just need it to account for mass sometimes. And we'll try and indicate that in the next video. Okay, so with that, I think we have come to the end of this video and we will see you on the next video.